Hi, I'm James Hamilton from Stumping Up's Woodworking Journal, and my table saw is the heart of my workshop. Whether you're new to woodworking or you've been at it for a while now, there's a lot to know about effectively using a table saw and a lot to forget over time. So over the next few days, I'm going to help you tune up your knowledge, so to speak. Over five short tutorials, we'll discuss table saw safety, how to make effective rip cuts, how to make effective cross cuts, and how to cut better miters and bevels. And finally, we'll talk about how to get the best cuts in plywood. You'll get some important reminders and maybe pick up some new tips along the way. As each video is released, I'll add a link to the notes below so you can watch the whole series if you like. Just click on show more if you're on YouTube. This is part one, table saw safety. It'll be the longest, I think, but most important part of the whole series. I don't care if you've used your saw safely for decades, we all need a refresher from time to time so we don't become complacent. We'll talk about important safety accessories, some of which you may never have considered before, and I'll give you some mental checklists you can use in your own shop. Then as we move to the actual cuts in the next four parts, I'll add tips and techniques that are specific to completing those tasks safely too. The most important table saw safety accessory you can have is your blade guard. If you're one of those people who think you don't need a blade guard because you're really careful to keep your hands away from the blade, you don't understand the most important function of a blade guard. It's to prevent kickback. Kickback occurs when the wood pinches against the back of your saw blade. Not only can it shoot a workpiece back at you with enough force to put a hole in a wall, it can happen so fast that your hand is pulled into the blade. Most table saw amputations happen to people who say, I know better than to stick my hand into the blade. But they never accounted for kickback pulling their hand in before they had any idea what was going on. Now what if your saw doesn't have a blade guard because you broke it or you lost it or you bought your saw used without one? Is it safe to use that saw? Only if you have a riving knife or an aftermarket splitter installed. A riving knife is a piece of steel that's mounted behind the blade so if the wood presses against it, the pressure will be on the riving knife, not on the blade's teeth. Just like the splitter on your blade guard, a riving knife will protect you from kickback. And because it raises and falls with the saw blade, you can leave it in place for almost any cut, including those that don't go all the way through a workpiece. Older saws usually don't give you the option of installing a riving knife though. So what then? Well, you'll have to make something that functions the same way. A while ago, we made a video showing you how to make zero clearance inserts with built-in wooden splitters. When used properly, these will protect you from kickback as well. If you're using a riving knife or an aftermarket splitter, does that mean you can throw that blade guard away forever? No, because while kickback is the most common cause of table saw injuries, the blade guard will also protect you from other potential dangers. For one thing, it creates a physical barrier between you and the blade. Nobody's going to lift the blade guard with their hand and proceed into the blade. Even if you get distracted and you take your eye off the saw, the guard will provide a reminder you can feel that says, don't go any further. In the rare instance that someone may trip and fall forward onto their saw, the guard will protect them as well. The guard also prevents chips and debris from flying up into your face, and it greatly improves dust collection, keeping all but the finest dust from flying all over the shop. You need your blade guard. I use mine every day in the shop. I only take it off if I have to, and when I do, I always install a riving knife or an aftermarket splitter in its place. I would not use my saw without these essential safety features, and neither should you. Can you imagine going through life blind and deaf? Our eyesight and hearing are precious, so it boggles my mind that people take so many risks with them. Even if it's just for one cut at the table saw, put your safety glasses on. And not just regular eyeglasses like mine. You want protection all the way around. I know a guy who had a little knot fly out of a piece of pine he was cutting, deflected off the bill of his cap, and whacked him in the eye behind his glasses. He wears his hat backwards now. But if you get a pair of safety glasses that are designed to slip over eyeglasses like mine, even if you don't wear eyeglasses beneath them, you'll be protected from all sides. So this is the style I recommend. I'll link to them in the notes below this video. These also have another important safety feature. Pull out earplugs built in that retract when you're done using them. Do you know what tinnitus is? You'll find out if you don't wear your hearing protection. 
The problem is few woodworkers will go to the trouble of putting on hearing protection to make one or two cuts. They think there's no harm in exposing their ears for a short time, but those cuts can add up over time to do real damage. The world is full of guys spending their retirement half deaf because they were too lazy to grab their hearing protection. You don't want to be like that, so protect yourself. That's one of the reasons I wear Isotune's Bluetooth earbuds. Instead of listening to the radio in the shop, I listen with these, which provide great sound along with EPA certified hearing protection. Then when I have to use a machine, like the table saw, even for one quick cut, I don't even have to think about my ears. They're already being protected because I have these things in. It's really the only way I've managed to force myself to protect my ears every time I use a machine. Isotunes is a sponsor of Stumping Up's Woodworking Journal, but they're also good people and they make a great product. I really encourage you to use the link below this video to check them out. They may just save your ears. Push sticks are essential safety devices. As a general rule, if you can spread your fingers and touch the blade with your thumb and the fence with your pinky, you should be using a push stick. In most cases though, I prefer a wooden push block like this one. You can make them yourself, you can make a bunch out of them from just one two by six or two by eight. It's tall, so my hand is well above the blade. And I like the thicker material because it's less likely to tip, which could force the board toward the blade. The heel hooks on the edge of the board as I push it through the cut while the body rests on top to provide downward pressure to keep the board flat on the table. Sometimes, such as when I'm cutting thin strips, I'll let the blade cut right through the bottom of the push block. If it gets all chewed up, it's no problem to trim a bit off and it's like new again. But for a push block to work properly, you have to have it nearby. You don't want to be halfway through the cut and your push block is out of reach somewhere because then you're likely to take a risk and make the cut without it. So make sure it's close before you begin your cut. For that reason, I also keep one of these push sticks on top of my table saw fence. This one's even magnetic, so I could stick it to the saw itself if I wanted to. While I prefer the wide, tall push block, this is my backup plan for when I inevitably forget the bigger one somewhere else in the shop. What about protecting yourself from airborne dust? There's some debate about what fine dust will do to you. I'm in my early 40s and I hope to be working out here for another 25, 30 years. Breathing in anything that long can't be good for you, so I take the risk. My saw has built-in dust collection, but if I'm spending more than a couple minutes making cuts, I'm going to put on a dust mask. It just makes sense, and at the very least, it'll reduce picking time to extract all those dust boogers later. I bet you never considered a metal detector as a safety accessory, but if you work with reclaimed lumber or anything that may have bits of metal embedded in it, you need one of these. It's unlikely that a saw blade striking a nail or something will cause part of that nail to come out of the wood and hit you, but you can easily damage a tooth on the blade itself, and then that piece of carbide can fly off and strike you. So if you work with pallet wood or anything you aren't sure about, check it before you cut with a metal detector. Speaking of the quality of the wood you work with, a table saw is not meant to cut rough lumber. You must be able to place a flat surface on top of the saw and a straight edge against the fence. If you try to cut a cupped or warped board on a table saw, you're just asking for a dangerous kickback halfway through when the cut begins to flatten out, pinching the blade. Likewise, a crooked edge against a fence is highly likely to cause the workpiece to shift during the cut, pressing against the side of the blade and potentially kicking back at you. If you have a rough board, mill it on the jointer first or cut it with a bandsaw or a handheld jigsaw instead of the table saw. It's just not worth the risk. A lot of woodworkers share space in a garage or outbuilding with the rest of the family. The table saw gets shoved aside to make room for a car or bikes, you name it. And it may be weeks or even months before you use it again. A lot can happen in that time, so it's important to give your saw a quick inspection before you use it. Here are eight things to look for. First, Check the blade guard for damage. Make sure the splitter isn't bent and that nothing will come into contact with the blade when it's turned on. Check the blade itself. If something has been thrown on top of the saw, especially if you don't have a blade guard, one of the saw's teeth may have been damaged. You don't want a piece of that carbide flying off at you. Check the fence. Make sure that it will securely lock in place and that it aligns with your miter slot. Check the blade's alignment. It should also be parallel to the miter slot. 
Check the cord for damage. Make sure the switch works properly so the saw can be turned off quickly if you need to. Check the saw itself. Turn it on, observe it. If anything looks or sounds or smells out of place, turn it off and find out what the problem is. Make sure safety accessories have not walked away on you, including your push block and your eye and ear protection. And number eight, clean up your environment. Junk piled on top of the saw, even away from the general cutting area, can shift and fall, causing a dangerous distraction at the worst possible moment. The floor around the saw should also be clear of tripping hazards or obstacles. And there should be enough room behind the saw for the full length of anything you intend to rip. Finally, every time you use your saw, before you begin any cut, ask yourself four questions. Am I tired? Am I distracted? Am I in a rush? And am I sure? When you're tired, you can make poor decisions and you can lose your focus, making mindless movements, especially during repetitive cuts that can lead to disaster. Dangerous distractions can include trying to carry on a conversation while you work, a shot dog that knocks something over, or even a child playing nearby that creates some sort of commotion that takes your mind or your eyes off what you're doing at a critical moment. Being in a rush can lead you to take risks like working without your safety gear in place, getting your fingers too close to the blade, or reaching for an offcut before the blade has completely stopped spinning. But most of all, you should always be sure that what you're doing is safe. If you have any doubt, any little voice in your head saying, this is a bad idea, stop and reconsider. Find a safer way, make a jig, or use a different tool. Table saws are essential woodworking machines. I wouldn't want to work without one. If you use yours responsibly, without cutting corners, taking risks, or neglecting good safety practices, you'll keep your fingers for a lifetime. In our next part of this series, we'll look at cross cuts. If that video is already posted, I encourage you to watch it now using the link below this video. Again, if you're on YouTube, just click on Show More below. See you there.